There's a story we're all told growing up here. It's about a team that played a half century ago, long before this city became the new title town USA. These guys were old school. They were misfits and marauders, wreaking havoc on the ice. Here you see the pyrotechnics. And becoming gods wherever they went in town. They revolutionized the sport. They defined this city. If you can't beat them, belt them. And in the middle of it all, that kid with the number four jersey from Parry Sound. The difference this year is Bobby Orr. On his way to becoming the greatest to ever play the game. Shoot it, go! Yeah, I said it, and I meant it. Score, Bobby Orr! Anyway, we still tell this story here, passing it down from generation to generation. In my case, from grandfather to his grandson, whose first words were Bobby Orr. And Bobby, and Espo, and Cheesy, and Turk, Chief, Haji, and Harry, they still love to talk about it too. Bobby Orr! They still love to look at that picture. That's everything in one image, frozen in time above the ice. So now we'll tell you the story, because well, like I said, it never gets old telling it. This is the tale of the 1970 Boston Bruins. Big, bad, and Bobby. First and foremost, you can even put this into perspective over the last 20 years. So you have the Patriots winning all the Super Bowls, you have the Red Sox finally winning championships. In the midst of that, the Celtics win a championship, and the Bruins win a Stanley Cup. Boston is always still a hockey town. Looking back on the past when we still had a chance, we were pawns in a game that we could not win. The passion in that city for that team, it was omnipresent. It was everywhere. Anybody who grew up in Boston or is from Boston knows that 72. Oh, he scored! Well, how do you want to play? You want to play with skill, and they get outskill you. You want to fight them, they'd outfight you. The one thing about this city is it fancied itself as a blue-collar city, and this was the perfect team for that. When Bobby and that Bruins team came along, they just galvanized the whole state. A standing ovation from this capacity crowd at Boston Garden. They were just such a bunch of personalities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bobby Orr, hockey's most gifted star. That team just lives on. But it wasn't always that way. At the start of the 60s, yeah, we had the Celtics dynasty beginning, but baseball and hockey were a whole different story. The Boston sportscape was kind of like a barren desert. The Red Sox were pathetic jokes. We didn't think much of ourselves. I know that's hard to believe today because we're, you know, we have all these championships between the Red Sox and the Patriots. We had nothing then. But don't mistake a lack of success with a lack of passion, because as much as any city in America, Boston loved its hockey team. They had a very firm fan base. That's when I, I remember going to my first game and walking to the garden and seeing that white ice for the first time. It was a dump, but it felt like a palace. For lack of a better word, I would say there was a charm to them, even though they lost. I remember the story, this is how bad they were. It was a fantasy story, but it was written as if it was the truth that the Bruins had discovered this lumberjack in northern Quebec, and he stood four feet tall and six feet wide, which is the dimensions of the net. And so nobody's going to score on this guy. That's how bad they were. They were just dying for a savior. And eventually, a kid from Parry Sound, Ontario, starts playing junior hockey for the Oshawa Generals. You read a great deal about them. If you haven't seen them, Bobby Orr is with Oshawa. Now, why did you decide to choose Boston? Well, uh, I think that Boston is building their team now, and i just like to be a part of their building. Bobby Orr was 14 years old when he signed with the Bruins organization in 1962, and pretty soon after, word got to Boston about the kid defenseman who'd taken over the Junior League. I specifically remember becoming aware of the Bruins when my father and my uncles were talking about, um, he's, he's coming, 
the savior is coming. As a kid, you're picking up this name, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Orr. In 1966, at the age of 18, he joined the Bruins, and from his first game in the NHL, has been one of big league hockey's most talked about performance. When Bobby arrived in uh, 1966, there was a new, new sense of hope. Now, with all the publicity that you've had in the papers, do you feel the question that? Oh, I think I could do without it, but uh, I feel that well, they can write all they want, but all you can do is your best. I don't know if he felt pressure, but uh, I just love watching him. I mean, he could skate like the wind. Bobby Orr, coming up the center. Bobby Orr was magical. It seemed to me like everybody else was skating and he was flying or gliding or something different. Well, those end-to-end -end rushes. Gets loose, still going. I was only nine or 10 years old, but I knew I had never seen it before. He'd lead the brush up the ice, but he'd be the first guy back to block a shot. Takes his shot or stopped it. He didn't even wear shoulder pads. Has anybody told you that so far? You know he didn't wear shoulder pads, right? He didn't wear shoulder pads. He was the future. Everybody knew he was the future. The writers, the, uh, the coaches, he, he was going to be it. In that first year, he won the Calder Trophy as the league's outstanding rookie. But even if Bobby immediately became a star, the team still finished in the cellar. The year before I showed up, you were in fifth place. Yeah. At the end of my first year, you were in, you were in sixth. So <laughs> Bobby brought a lot to the team at that time. <laughs> There was a sense at the end of that season that they were going in the right direction. You could tell objectively that the Bruins were not going to be cellar dwellers much longer. And at the end of the 1966-67 season, the Bruins made a move that ensured better times were ahead. A blockbuster trade with Chicago to bring Phil Esposito, Ken Hodge, and Fred Stanfield to Boston. The big thing was that trade was Espo when Phil Esposito came to town and Stanfield and Hodge and those guys. And that's when the real transformation uh, took place. We make a trade, you three guys from Chicago, and then, I mean, that, that was it. Well, it's just it, everything blended. But here we have good goaltending. Our defense was solid. When yeah, Bobby showed up, then Phil showed up, you knew it. It's what, it was gonna happen soon, but now we gotta do it. Milt, after last season you took over as general manager, the club had finished out of the playoffs for eight years. How did you assess the situation when you took over the job last year? Well, first of all, when I was asked to be the next general manager, and I said, what do I do? Because <laughs> it wasn't a very pleasant situation to go into. Harry Sinden, the coach of that team, he said for years we were kind of the laughing stock of the NHL. There was a kind of just a loser's mentality which is nobody's fault, really. It just creeps in. Sinden had a team that was getting pushed around. Detroit had introduced forechecking to the league. They had that identity. Of course, Montreal had speed. And even the Rangers, who struggled to make the playoffs like we did, they became known as a pretty smooth passing team. We lacked identity. But we ended up in 67 with some players that give us that identity. Milt Schmidt's blockbuster trade to get Esposito, Hodge, and Stanfield set up a whole new kind of hope for the Bruins. Due to a couple of moves, I've got about 10 new faces compared to last year's. Why, this is entirely a different hockey club. We got size, and we got some fellows that did play a winning hockey, and they more or less brought that winning ways along with them. He shoots, he scores! And it's all tied We became a very good team because of that trade. I mean, how the three guys like that in your lineup, oh my God. It was really a coalescing, and certainly Esposito was a big part of that. They finally had this big center who could score. Shooting, scoring! With Esposito, Hodge, and Stanford, along with Bobby, we now had a nucleus of an excellent team. Esposito scores! Bill Esposito got the rebound on Bobby Orr. When they got these guys from Chicago, you hear, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, like that. Sanderson going in. Psycho! The Bruins also had a boost from the 21-year-old rookie they called Turk. Derek Sanderson, who had the perfect style and attitude for the team's new identity. 
The best word to describe him was brash. Breath of fresh air, I'll tell you. Here we go, Kurt back in Sanderson. Confidence, I've always had a lot of confidence in myself. A lot of times I've come up short, but I'm just going to keep plugging and if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, then I just got to work a little bit harder. He was kind of the disruptor on ice. Right and Sanderson. I don't know why guys fight the way they do today. Grab both the shoulder, bring the number over the shoulder. That totally takes the right arm out. Now, Sanderson punching over the head of Matt Pavlik. He could skate, he could score, he could check. He was kind of a multifaceted player. His teammates immediately took to him, and he was really irreverent kind of guy. I sat beside him the whole time, and I, <laughs> he entertained the hell out of me, I could tell you that. <laughs> We usually had Mondays off, and so Monday was boys' night out. Well, they knew what Tuesday and Wednesday would bring when they got back on the ice. I remember Derek saying to me one time when I was putting him through a grueling workout, he says, is that all you got? More than that. He was right. That's all I had left to me. They had more. The Bruins were all about having more, more than the opponents could handle. Physically, they were big, and they were called the Big Bad Bruins. Big Bad Bruins. You know, they call us the Big Bad Bruins, and that was the identity we established. We had been stepped on in Boston for so many years. I think our players, particularly players that had been through those years, thought it was about time maybe that we delivered a little vendetta ourselves. Training camp, getting to know each other, and Bobby, we were out together after practice, and he said, OK, nobody, no Bruins going to be in a fight alone, ever. Again. And here we go again. Both dropping their gloves. One for all, all for one. That was our motto. I mean, if somebody got in trouble, we'd all jump right in. You don't always like the guy that you're playing with, but when you're on the ice, I don't give a crap. He's your teammate. You gotta like him. You gotta stick up for him. I really like who we were. Everybody protect each other. Oh, they're held up pretty good now. I got the stitches out tonight, so I guess I'm going to live. You want to play with skill, they get out skilled. You want to fight them, they'd outfight you. You're going to get either out talented or you're going to get beat up. And Cashman and Harper start to go. And here's that left hand of uh, Cashman. And here comes Bobby Orr. Esposito, shoot, he's goal! After spending pretty much the entire decade in last place, the new look Big Bad Bruins was shocking everybody halfway through the 67-68 season, fighting for first. The NHL standings in the Eastern Division at Boston and Chicago tied for the lead with 45 points. It's Harry Sinden behind the bench. He's done an amazing job with his Boston Bruins this year, the team everybody picked for last place. Goal, goal Goaltending, which had been a bit of a problem through the 60s, was solved when we had Gary Cheevers. He had an edge to his play as well. Kennedy and Cheevers are swinging. He rhymed right in with the rest of the poem. <laughs> I figured that they would do well, but not really as well as we have been doing, let's face it. I think that team embodied the city of Boston as much as any team has ever embodied the city of Boston. Left right into Warren, down he goes. It wasn't easy, it wasn't pretty. That's how we love it in Boston. It looked like Boston was setting up for a long-awaited return to the playoffs. But then came a nightmare plot twist. Bobby Orr went down. When he got hurt, he, he was very upset because he knew we had a team that could win and he knew he was a big factor. He didn't want to miss any games. Bobby was the type of player, whether he was hurt or not hurt, he wanted to play. This all you've got to do, sit around while your team's out on the West Coast? Well, I'd sure like to go out there with him, I'll tell you. The leg itself doesn't give you any pain at the moment? No, it's, it's sort of touch, but uh, I put partial weight on it now. Do you uh, expect that you'll be skating in, say, four or five weeks? I hope so. The trains which clatter past Boston Garden always end up in Everett, and the Bruins, who play hockey inside, always end up in the cellar. This year, though, some tough guys got off the train here, and now the Bruins have jumped the track and are as dangerous as a diesel on the loose. Thank God! Into the top left.
left hand corner. By the winter of 1968, there was no mistaking how different these Bruins were from the teams that had come before them, making an all-out push for the playoffs for the first time in nearly a decade. They really have joined together as a team, and when there's trouble on the ice, it's, I think this very indicative right there of how they feel about each other. Everyone on the ice is getting involved. He fired. Go! Bobby Orr had fought his way back to the lineup after missing 17 games following knee surgery. Though the absence wouldn't hurt him come awards time, as he won his first Norris Trophy as the league's top defenseman, while Turk won the Calder Trophy as the top rookie. Bobby, congratulations. Thing you have in mind now, like maybe a uh, most valuable player, is that what your next goal is? No, uh, Don, I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with the award. Uh, really, uh, Next trophy I'd like to use, be able to touch the Stanley Cup. Bobby and his teammates would get their first shot at the Cup in the spring of 68, with the Bruins finally back in the playoffs. From the Forum in Montreal, Hockey Night in Canada presents the opening game of the Stanley Cup quarterfinal for the Eastern Division. Tonight, the Boston Bruins meet the Canadians. Now they were coming into their own, a pretty darn good hockey team. But even with Orr in his second season... And the series is underway. The fact of the matter is, the Habs were still the Habs. Ferguson going in, back to the shoot, he The Canadians quickly swept the upstart Bruins in four games. But next to the frustration, there was absolutely, finally, real hope for the future. I remember coming back from Montreal, I remember the airport and there was a fountain and I was getting a drink and Harry was standing there and I said to Harry, we're gonna win the Stanley Cup in three years. Phil Esposito's first year in Boston had gone well, but head coach Harry Sinden had a feeling that for the Bruins to raise the cup, his best scorer would have to do even more. I think he got 36 goals in his first year. I said, 36 goals is not enough for you, Phil. I said, you got to get a lot more goals than that, the way you play. He says, you guys, no matter how many you get, you only want more. And I said, well, you can get more, a lot more. Picked up the rebound, right to the score, and it's the lead off. The driving force of that team is really Bobby Orr on defense and Phil Esposito on offense. The pass goes to Esposito, shoots his goal! And Phil used to always say, just give me the puck, I'll score the goals. And he did. You may be a lover and a fighter, but you love to score goals, I'll tell you that, huh? Better believe it. 68-69 would be the best season of Esposito's career to that point. Career highs with 49 goals and a league leading 77 assists, which made Espo the first player in NHL history to surpass 100 points in a season. The Bruins have been down in the cellar, and then you get him. He breaks the records, like, forget it. It was amazing, amazing. And Bobby Orr and him were in a tandem in a power play that was awesome. Circled behind a shot. Go! Go to Espo would cap off his season with a hot trophy as the league's MVP. From the line. Go! And, that's the record Bobby Orr has and Bobby would set the record for most points by a defenseman on his way to his second straight Norris Trophy. This year, the whole team is playing as a team. And for that reason, I think that's why uh, they're where they are today. The Bruins own Boston in the area. And this was at a time when there was only like three major networks. But my god, the ratings, 25% of all TV viewers in the Boston area were tuned into those games. Bruins were must-see TV before there was such a phrase. It was Sunday nights was the real game. Because my parents were very strict. I had to be in bed, usually by 9 o'clock on a weeknight. But Sunday nights, my dad would say, get your homework done. And we would, we'd have dinner, and we'd sit in our family room, which is not a very big room at all. But now we had the color TV, so we had UHF, so we could watch the Bruins. They had a little 10-inch TV with, you know, a coat hanger on the on the top of it, uh, and it had UHF, it was channel 38. WSBK, it's TV 38, and you know, you, we only had the one TV in the house, so when you watched the Bruins game, everybody watched the Bruins game, but that, that didn't matter. My mother and my aunts were all 
massive Bruins fans. They were really fans of Bobby Orr. They thought he was handsome and he was good looking and he was so nice. You know, I would watch, I'd be f a foot and a half from the TV, just living and dying with every game. It was like you were right in the building, you know? So I had to have my teeth brushed, I had to have my pajamas on, and then I'd sit on the couch with my dad and we'd watch the game. Me and Fred, that was our thing. A neat pass to Dallas Smith, with McKenzie in on the line, Dallas Smith is coming in, a pass, he almost got it through. So hopes were high in Boston in the spring of 69 as the Bruins went back to the playoffs and faced off against the Maple Leafs in the quarterfinal round. The Bruins were dominating game one, up 6-0 in the second period when Toronto's Pat Quinn set his sights on Bobby across the blue line. You could have heard a pin drop. To see him go down was very upsetting. I put my glove under his head because I knew he was out. I mean, we were on the ice and I, I knew he was out cold. Bobby. 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 Here is the franchise player, and not only that, but he's the he's the city's darling. He has there's been this wonderkin since he showed up. It frightened all of us because we knew when Bobby stayed down, he was hurt. Certainly, the reaction in the house and the neighborhood immediately was somebody has to kill Pat Quinn. Quinn goes off to the penalty box. There's fans trying to get at him. He wants to go at Green, and now they start in. Pavlich moves in. A bench-emptying brawl broke out. I mean, everybody was fighting everybody. The linesman away and punches a linesman. Forbes Kennedy, the fans are getting at Kennedy. A fan punches him on the head as he goes over by the glass. The next day in the hotel lobby, kind of a rough-looking gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he came by and he says, would, would you like me to take care of him? I said, no, 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 we'll take care of ourselves. Remarkably, Bobby would return for game two and help the Bruins sweep Toronto in four games. Next up were the Eastern Division semifinals and the defending champion Canadians. And with the league's expansion teams all out in the Western Division, everyone knew whoever won this series was pretty much guaranteed to take home the cup. The first game of the series established the pattern for what was to follow. The determined Bruins went into a 2 to nothing lead, only to see it disappear late in the third period as Montreal scored twice to tie the game and again early in overtime to win it. The series would be tight, with three games going to overtime. And in the end, the Canadians' experience under pressure seemed to make the difference. You're up two, three goals, and you relax a little bit, and the next thing you go, you know, a tie game. We had the opportunities, but something was in the back of your head, and you just couldn't. The Bruins were down three games to two, when the series went back to Boston for game six. Millions of television viewers saw the action extend into a second overtime period in the dramatic sixth game in Boston. Bruins clear the puck up along the left wing board. Provo intercepts it there. Provo, the Malibu, Malibu shoots, he scores! The Canadians have won the game two to one, and the series four games to two. It's a very emotional moment, especially when you think you have a good chance of winning. Yeah, that was, we, I remember crying about it, you know. The worst thing after a series like that is shaking hands, going through that lineup and shaking hands with somebody and saying, congratulations, because you know you don't mean it. Seriously, it's the worst feeling in the world, but it sets you up for the next year. By the end of the 1960s, the city of Boston was totally in love with their big, bad Bruins. It's great about the Bruins. Bobby Orr, Esposito. Esposito's Italian power this year is going to Go Esposito, shot down! When you went to bed and you dreamed it was, it was all hockey. Never dreamt about football. 
I don't know that I ever watched a Patriots game. They loved the Bruins in the garden, and they loved them all over the streets of New England. There were plenty of sports to be played in New England, but because of Bobby Orr, because of the Bruins, everybody wanted to play hockey. Kids that were brand new to the game, that didn't know how to skate, were starting to play street hockey because they were such fans of Bobby Orr and the Big Bad Bruins. It got to the point where they put up boards around the basketball courts for the street hockey leagues, and they took the tennis nets out and took out the stanchions and turned those into street hockey courts. Everyone played ball hockey. If you went through the streets of Boston, everyone was playing ball hockey. And it's funny, I'm equated today with the NBA and with basketball. I was playing street hockey all day, every day. I didn't want to play basketball. I wanted to play hockey. Why? Because I was watching the Bruins and I wanted to be like them. Winds up. He fires. Oh! And you got to admire that guy, that Bobby Orr. The interest in hockey has always been high in this area. But when that team was formed, it took off because they were kind of pop idols. Who's your favorite Bruin? Phil Esposito and Bobby Orr. Bobby Orr took people that weren't hockey mad, like my mom. He turned people like her into hockey fans. Bobby Orr is fantastic, what can I say? They had captivated the entire city. Oh, in Boston, we couldn't go anywhere. We want to got 30 seconds here. Oh, just, <laughs> we could go nowhere, basically, in New England after a game or whatever without having fans coming over to see us. Phil Esposito was doing a personal appearance in Worcester. My dad's like, we have to go to this, we have to go to this. So we're waiting in line for hours. And we're getting closer and closer. And here we are now. There's Phil. And me and my dad take the Polaroid picture. My dad starts talking. My dad talks the entire minute. Phil, I love you. You're the greatest. Blah, 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 blah. The signs of thing. We walk away. I never say a word to Phil Esposito. If you were a Celtics fan, nope. You were following the Bruins. If you were a Patriots fan, good luck finding you, because there were about 12 of you. The whole city was rallying around the Bruins. Fires, go! And the Bruins go ahead, six to one. Yeah, we were everywhere, though. We, we were, were, were out there doing clinics. Yeah. We were around town. We flew commercially a lot. Right, yeah. So we were in the airport with the fans. So the fans felt comfortable approaching us. They were a swashbuckling kind of a team. I don't want to talk about any of their business outside of the rink, but they had a lot of fun, let's put it that way. Perfect example of how close we were was when I hurt my knee and I'm in a <laughs> cast from my groin down to my toes. All of a sudden the door opens and this lunatic over here, or the mask on, <laughs> says, that's what we're coming to get you tonight for the party. I said, what party? He says, my place to Brandy Nyard. We're it's taking you to the party. I said, what are you, crazy? I can't, how am I? I'm kind of, yeah. And I'll never forget, on the bottom of the screen came a Esposito kidnapped from Mass General Bobby. Oh, I better call Dr. Rowe right now. The Bruins were going to have a good time no matter what was going on. And no one, and I mean no one, had a better time in those years than Turk, Derek Sanderson. As you know, times have changed in professional sports. Our heroes no longer look as though they've leapt straight out of a box of Wheaties. Not all of them, anyway. The Joe Namath lifestyle has caught on. And in hockey, it's typified by Derek Sanderson. I remember saying to him, Turk, you know, should take it easy a little bit. He says, Phil, Bobby's the best player in the game. He gets all his publicity. You score goals, you get all his publicity. How the hell am I going to get publicity? <laughs> And he so, did what he did. Entertained. <laughs> well, I suppose in the course of the year, the player most often requested for an interview, especially by young people, is our next guest, Derek Sanders. Now, what about Derek's look? <laughs> Derek's look. The long hair, the beard. Derek was trying to be Joe Namath, I think. How do you like being called Little Joe? Oh, I don't know about that. He was our Joe Namath, if you will, in terms of fashion and women and, you know, cigarettes, booze, women all of those things that sort of followed Derek everywhere. I let this image explode. Oh my God, I couldn't keep up with it. Are you really that much of a swipe blocker? Freedom of the press, they can film what they want. I like to enjoy life, that's all. He was so reckless, really, both on and off the ice. He was kind of the bad boy, if you will. He could have been a raider. Hockey at that point in time, going to late 60s, primarily a Canadian game, much more conservative. Derek Sanderson tapped into the counterculture of that moment. I think he's a groovy person, I really do. It's just what Boston needs, he's so colorful, he's a swinger. It's just something that we need, you know, he's youth and he's just cool. He and Joe Namath owned a nightclub together. Tonight is more or less a, an official greeting 
for Derek Sanderson as part of the organization of Bachelors 3 in Boston. It's, it's a quiet little place, and uh, it wasn't quiet the other night when I was there, I'll tell you. Well, it livens up sometimes, I don't know. So life was good for the Bruins and their fans as the 1960s came to a close, and the 69-70 season would be the biggest and best one yet. You know, someone once told me, if you play in fear of letting your teammate down, you're going to be a successful team. And that's what we did. The mood was trying to win the Stanley Cup, the Three Musketeer yeah, motto, one yeah. for all, all for one. Not only on the ice, but off the ice. Um, yeah. We would have family gatherings yeah. with our wives and our children. Always kids in the dressing room. Yeah, yeah always. Uh, always. Practice, and so that was important to us. <laughs> yeah. For us to be successful, we just felt we had to be like that. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, we, and we were having a blast, and we were winning games. Pass to Phil Esposito. He drives. Out front, it's loose. Oh! 1969-70 was the fourth year of the Bobby Orr era in Boston. And after the Bruins' hearts had been broken the year before, expectations were higher than ever. We're hungry enough, and I think that uh, this team has to be considered this year. Or has it. Across to Esposito. He guns. Go! It's 2 one Boston. In 69-70, uh, the thinking, if you're on the opposition, is that I run out of ways to stop this uh, machine. What do I do now? The big bad Bruins were unstoppable when the first puck dropped, going undefeated through their first seven games. And the hottest team in hockey was also the hottest ticket in town. Love forget Johnny McKenzie. He got hurt, and they're carrying him out in a stretcher. It's can I have your tickets for more? <laughs> <laughs> there were no tickets. There were no tickets. You couldn't go down to the garden and say, "I think I'll go to a game tonight." This was the hottest ticket in town, and they only sold them out of Boston Garden. Two or three of my pals, we would come down at three in the morning. Well, at three in the morning, the line was already down Causeway Street and into the North End. And then they would open the doors to the garden, and then we would sit by section, waiting to be called down to the box office. Eventually, you know, nine o'clock would come, and they'd say, section 99. And section 99, we'd all file down dutifully. I'm pretty sure my dad scooped up any tickets he could get. And I don't think I went more than three times a year. And you know what? I'm glad, because it was an event. And it was very special. And as the season went on, there was no doubting. These Bruins were Boston's most special club yet. We were cocky, we were arrogant, and we backed it up. Derek Sanderson, off the face, and he scored! What a shot! Great save by Severin. Highway robbery at its very best. But you know, the guy that drove the whole thing was Bobby Orr. In, in every situation, offensively, defensively. Bobby Orb had that total package. He was an amazing player. Orb going in alone. Hit shot, go! Nobody predicted that a defenseman could dominate the way Bobby dominated the league. Here comes Orb, still going. The shot, go! Go Bobby York rewrote what it was to be a defenseman. You know, he would go right into the offensive zone. Teams didn't know how to defend against this. Back to war. All of a sudden, he's got running room. Getting around Harris, moving in, scores! That's Bobby Orr's 100th point of the season. No other defenseman in the National Hockey League history has ever done it. It's Sunday night, and your dad's going to let you stay up till 9.30 so you can watch the game. And Bobby is behind the net, and he's coming around. And you know, like, whoever the first guy is, he's toast. But then now you're wondering, can he make it all the way? Well, you know he can make it all the way. But then the question becomes, what is he going to do? It was just, you know he's going to do something great. You just didn't know which great thing it was going to be. Goal! Goal set up! If you saw an amazing goal by Bobby Orr on television, we'd be outside five minutes later recreating the goal. There's all kinds of stories where Bobby uh, exploits were just amazing. I mean, we'd sit on the bench and we'd say, he did that, he did that. He was killed off a penalty. Oh, yeah. And dropped his gloves, went around, and skated around. Killing a penalty, oh, he's ragging the puck. Ragging the puck. Bobby Orr's doing a bit of fancy stick handling between the two blue lines. 
I was on the ice with him. And Cheesy said, hey, Espo, you want the racing form? <laughs> Look at him go. What I remember most of them was Bobby had went around the net, stopped, picked up his glove. <laughs> both <laughs> both, both, both benches were cheering, right? Well, he thought he, he had the puck the whole time, then finally he scored. That's right. Go! That was the, one of the greatest plays I've ever seen in my life. Bobby Orr made too many of those plays to count, and his 120 points during the 1969-70 season were amazingly more than double what any other defenseman in hockey history had ever scored. Bobby turned just 22 years old in March of 1970 on his way to his third straight Norris Trophy, already revolutionizing the idea of what a hockey defenseman could do but all he cared about was being on the ice when that other trophy was raised. I never thought about changing the game. I was playing a game that I loved. I was realizing a dream. I didn't think about scoring X number of goals. My goal was to be on a Stanley Cup team and to help a team become the, become the best in the world. Bobby and the Bruins tied the Blackhawks with the most points of any team in the standings and started the playoffs against a very familiar rival, the Rangers. There was a dislike between the two teams, uh, basically, and, and that made a little more energy into the series. For me, we played the Rangers, we beat them. Yeah. yeah. I didn't think the Rangers could beat us Never. at all. Still, the Rangers put up a fight. Sanderson double team, and here we go. Sanderson is on the bottom as the Rangers have ganged up on Derek Sanderson. But the Bruins finished them off in six games. We had them down two games, nothing. They had a lot of guts to come back, but we never lost our cool the whole time and played together as a team. And this is still a great thrill. So next up were the Blackhawks. And for a few Bruins, a series that offered the perfect chance to settle some old scores. When you're playing against the Blackhawks, there's a little bit of hatred. They traded me. I wanted to show them and get a little more respect from the Blackhawks and Esposito the same way. It's been three years since I've been gone from there, and, and Boston is my home now, and uh, I like it here, and I don't even consider Chicago uh, where I played there anymore. <laughs> the Blackhawks looked like a pretty formidable bunch, and they had these great players like Stan Mikita, Bobby Hull, and they had this new kind of rookie of the year all-star goaltender in Tony Esposito, Phil Esposito's brother. Chicago, I know. I know Tony <laughs> very well. I mean, we were brothers. We always played well against Chicago, especially Phil. Phil used to score a lot of goals on Tony. He just had his number. And he definitely had his number in game one. Esposito, one man back, in with music. The shot, he scores! Here's Orr at the blue line. That's Phil Esposito, he should he scores! Esposito scores! And Phil Esposito puts it in for the hat trick. Phil owned his I brother. Owned, I owned, <laughs> yeah, you did own Phil owned Tony. Owned. Tony, I owned you. <laughs> and, it, and they made such a big thing of this. Esposito against Esposito. Oh, yeah. And Phil owned them. <laughs> oh, my God. And the Bruins owned the Blackhawks, too, sweeping Chicago in four games, with Esposito scoring nine points in the series, leading the Bruins to the brink of everyone's dream in Boston. The game is over. But now the Bruins race out onto the ice. Beating Chicago was emotional because, you know, the expansion division was not as strong as we were. And our chances of winning the next series were really high. We finished with Chicago, and uh, just a great effort today by the team, and uh, I feel great. We uh, only lost one game to the Western Division all year, and uh, I can't see us losing to them, and uh, I really feel great and happy right now. This is not a sit-in or a protest or a takeover. This people's park, with its instant housing, was constructed with one thing in mind, to keep comfortable for the long wait for the Bruins tickets in the Stanley Cup playoffs. When the playoff tickets went on sale, there were a certain number that went on sale uh, that were limited, like 2,000 or 4,000 seats. So you had to camp up. Nine o'clock this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. My brother's three years older than me, and he would be one of the guys that would go and camp out. They'd bring cardboard boxes to sleep overnight. I think you were only allowed to get two tickets per person. So if my brother got tickets, that was for him and his friends. So I never went to a playoff game, not until, you know, I was an adult. The Bruins were facing off against the St. Louis Blues, the best team by far out of the expansion clubs. 
Are you uh, afraid of a letdown against the West? No, I'm not. I'll tell you why. Because we have a tremendous amount of respect for St. Louis. We've only played one game in the three years of expansion that we've ever outclassed St. Louis, and that was a 7-1 game here this year. In every other game, they've either beaten us, tied us, or our wins have been awfully close. Going into the series, my only thought from a goaltender's perspective, they had Jock Plant and Glenn Hall. They had the two best goalies in the game in the series, right? And I said, they could probably beat us. They, were we just, were just, they played well, but we handled it we easily. We were better. The series started in St. Louis, and the Bruins, who led the league in goals for the season, showed no mercy. Cross the line, West ball drive, score! Down the middle. Shot, goal, six to Boston. The Bruins totally dominated the first three games, outscoring the Blues 16 to four. We knew and we could not sit back. We knew right then we had to, had to win all of them right in a row. First about everybody in Boston Gardens is prepared to give the Bruins a Stanley Cup this afternoon. However, there is the mere formality of a hockey game to go through. It was Mother's Day, it was May 10, uh, and I remember I was watching it on TV. Mother's Day, so that's funny because my mom hates hockey. But I know I watched this game, so thanks, Mom. I was watching it at home with my uncle, uh, Uncle Tony, upstairs. Oh, boy. Game four, I think we emotionally, we were probably at our highest point, thinking that, uh, you know, we were up 3 nothing. We're in the Boston Garden. We're going to win this in Boston. Turk had a tux on, <laughs> which means we were going to win, I guess, unless... In those I, days, were you wearing a tux? No, were you wearing a tux every day in those days? No, no. I, I <laughs> what, what are you doing? And I said, we're going to win. I want to be dressed up for the final moment. You have pressure all the time, but people expected us to win, and we were supposed to win that game because it was on home ice. Then you start thinking, you've got to get that first goal. Comes in front of the net for Rick Smith. Boston would get the first goal, but the Blues battled right back and were up 3-2 late in the third period before the Chief, Johnny Busick, tied it up. As the score is tied 3-3, the siren goes, we're into overtime. The biggest shock was when we were in the locker room and Harry Sinden called out the starting lineup for overtime. Sanderson, Wayne Carlton, and Eddie Westfall. And I'm looking at Phil and he's looking at me and what? <laughs> I remember saying to Turk, we're going to start. Oh, yeah. And uh, you're not even going to get on the ice. He says, no, you aren't. Because we're going to start and we're going to score. Guess what that is? <laughs> Has anyone ever questioned Harry on why he started Derry? I felt that that overtime would end in the first five minutes. And thinking the way I did about overtimes ending early, I thought we're better off to start a defensive line to get in the first shift. So Sanderson's line started, which normally wouldn't be the case. I mean, it was just a hunch. Sanderson starts for Boston with Carlton and Westfall on the wings, Orr and Ori on defense. Play underway, the first team to score wins the game. Any overtime, you're always leaning, you know, forward, when, in any play at any point, uh, a bad bounce, anything can happen. Here's Picard, out to Tim Ecclestone. Back to his own line to Jean-Guy Talbot. Talbot out to Keenan, he missed it, and Bobby Orr flipped it out at center to Sanderson. It's crazy. I think I was standing, because I'm like panicking. Racing in is Carlton for the Bruins. Centered and it's close in front. I was a foot and a half from the TV set, and every second seemed like an hour. Orr a shot, that's blocked by Talbot. Now Sanderson a drive, and that one whistled wide. There you go, oh, hold on. Go back and look at the video and count the shots he took before the puck came around the boards when I pinched in. Was oh, on the net? You got two of them? How many? Two. At really? least two. At Maybe least three. At least two. I hit the post. And don't, for the puck <laughs> to go to Bobby, it would come out the post. He would have scored that. Ori for the Bruins, tied up by Ecclestone and Berenson. Westfall rolled it in front, Sanderson. Only Bobby Orr could do this. Blocks the shot coming up the boards, keeps it in, gets it to Sanderson. And the Sanderson makes the most perfect pass he could ever make in his career. Sanderson to Orr! Bobby Orr! Scores in the Boston Bruins! The Bruins will stand the top! He scores the goal and he's flying. And it is one of those moments 
In real time, it felt like it was in slow motion. Remember specifically when the goal was scored, everybody in our house went nuts. And then as you're quieting down a little bit, you realize out the window, there was cheering close, there was cheering. It was like every house there was screaming going on. The roar is deafening here in Boston as they bring the Stanley Cup out onto the ice. When they won that championship, I don't know what Nirvana looks like, but that that's it. What a moment. What a moment for Boston. We owe it all to them because they're great fans and they supported us all year. They're just tremendous, the fans. Uh, uh, it's so great. I know, I know it's a, this team, unbelievable. We stayed inside to watch uh, the post-game celebration a little bit in the locker room. I'd have to say it was within an hour. We were outside, and essentially what we all did was we created that goal over and over again so everybody could have a chance to do it. And we're talking on cement. It's on the street. So you're still doing the trip and the fall into the thing into the corner. We did it over and over again. We must have done that for like three hours. That's before anybody was aware of the picture. That was just from watching it on television. The morning after, my father was having breakfast and I went in and it was, a, I guess it was Record American then? Yeah. yeah. Was yeah. that it was? Record, Record American. American. Mm -hmm. And he opened it up and that, that to show me. Well, who that took that picture? Was Ray that? Lucia. Ray Lucia says to me, come, 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 come with me, come with me. I was in the dark room. I hadn't seen this picture yet and he brings me down a photo engraving, and there was his picture. I just said, wow, I, I, I was in awe. I wish I took it. First time I saw the photo, I wanted one, and I got one. <laughs> and I had him sign it for me, and it's hanging in my house. I have many pictures up in my walls in my office, all family. Uh, Bobby Orr's the only person other than family that's up on my wall. I don't know what bar or restaurant in Massachusetts doesn't have that picture. Uh, I, I have, I think, three in my house. Uh, my kids have them. New England homes, you know, frankly, you have a picture of Jesus, John F. Kennedy, and Bobby Orr that shot. It was fun. one of the great pictures in sports. And like you say, the perfect guy but, to get the perfect goal. I mean, I was topped off a great year. It was the third straight year that Bobby Orr won the Norris Trophy. He also won the Hart, the Conn Smythe, and most amazingly, he became the first and still only defenseman to win the Art Ross Trophy, making him the only player in history to sweep all four of hockey's biggest awards. Do you have something else you want to accomplish in this game? Let's keep winning. It's, it's great to win. Uh, it'd be nice to win another Stanley Cup. The Bruins would win another cup two years later. The Bruins win the Stanley Cup, their second in the last three years. But after that, things started to splinter. Sanderson and goalie Jerry Cheevers would go on to the upstart WHA. Espo would reset his records for points and goals in a season. And that's the record breaker. Phil Esposito has scored 59 goals. And then finish his career in New York. And Bobby, well, what else is there to say about Bobby? In a town that's got a huge court of sports royalty, Bobby Orr's throne still sits a little higher than everyone else's. I love you all so much. I spent 10 years here in Boston, and they're the 10 best years of my life. Maybe because his peak was cut short by injuries, his legacy feels bigger still surrounded by a sense of what could have been. At that moment, Bobby Orr was invincible. And it was just a short time after that he was no longer invincible. But nothing will ever match that Stanley Cup. There were still plenty of trophies, plenty of records, and no argument about how much he mattered to a team that mattered and still matters a half century later. That team just lives on, you know? I don't know if any team will ever become as iconic as they were. I mean, that was a great hockey team with the greatest player ever to play. And they galvanized the city. And, and the way they did it, you know, the cast of characters, they were ours. For me, it was the perfect time, the perfect place, the perfect team. 
It was truly a team filled with larger than life characters who on that one special year put it all together and captured the imagination of an entire city.